Yeah, thank you so much for the kind uh, introduction. Thank you for um, having me, um, Oliver, uh, Christina, uh, Lionel, of course, and uh, Matt, and um, you know, putting together this uh, amaz uh, amazing event, which is slowly but uh, surely and sadly drawing to a close. I'm also happy, though, to be here as, as the very first of the last and uh, I thought I'd stand up, um, make sort of like positive use of my tallness, uh, also make me more dynamic as a speaker and maybe also work toward uh, keeping you more awake during the final session than I was at times uh, during the final session uh, yesterday. Uh, for disclosure, no dis disrespect to uh, any of the um, speakers. And. Um, so my uh, title is called uh, like very broad title, a title you give when you don't really know what uh, you book you're going to talk about. Um, and I, uh, when I arrived Wednesday and wrote the paper, I chose to focus on uh, Oscar Hokea's calling for a blanket dance, um, a, a text that I recently taught and had the fortune of inviting the author via Zoom to give a reading and conversation with my students. Was very um, enriching, and I'm happy to have the, like, the you know, occasion here to talk more deeply um, about it. And if you want to hear more about DG Nanook Okbeck's thoughts, I'm happy to uh, talk about uh, that later on. My experience has been, though, also that if you talk about demanding present day poetry at a conference that is not solely dedicated to present day demanding poetry, it's a good recipe for not getting any questions. So I thought I would use the novel as a text that is more inducive to, to discussion. So with all of that said, um, what does it mean to be a citizen in indigenous uh, terms? How are terms of citizenship in being a US citizen or a citizen of American Indian nation differently defined and in fraught relation uh, to each other? And how does citizenship as a form of native belonging manifest in day-to-day -day affairs. Now, with these questions in mind, the paper seeks to investigate the negotiations of citizenship in present-day indigenous literature in the US. And in it, I want to ask more specifically, how can present-day native literatures help us to view and understand citizenship as a framework of rights and responsibilities um, and as a term for articulating native political uh, formation vis-a-vis -vis -vis the state and within the community. And with a complete then next slide, and Oliver was so um, helpful in, in taking care of the slides for me, so I can stand over here. Uh, in order to address these um, questions, I turn to the 2020 uh, two debut novel calling for a blanket dance by Cherokee Kiowa author Oscar Hokia. And in it, uh, Hokia explores both a multi and intertribal reality among native communities in Oklahoma. The novel narrates across a span of almost 40 years the life of Eva Gimo Saddle from the perspective of various narrators that are all part of his extended family that include Cherokee, Kiowa, as well as family across the colonial border in Chihuahua, Mexico, creating a multifaceted kaleidoscope of narrators that are at the same time um, <clears throat> uh, that at the same time help to create a kaleidoscopic portrayal of what Hokea calls the intertribal multiculturalism of the Southwest. Citizenship, while not always necessarily referenced directly as such, plays out in multiple ways in these uh, scenarios. And oftentimes it is refracted through family and kinship connections of difference conflict, but also mutual support. Eva is a son of a turtle, a Gimo Saddle, who is Cherokee on her mother's and Kiowa on her father's side, and of Everardo Chavez from Chihuahua, Mexico. Being Kiowa and being Cherokee as designations of tribal nationhood are connected to different geographies in the novel. So Lawton for, um, and as a, a native of Lawton, right, like a, um, a, a, had that in mind from earlier. So Lawton on the one hand for Kiowa and Taliqua for Cherokee, different practices, the Agua dance for um, the Kiowa, the Storm dance for the Cherokee, and then also through family ties to fraught histories of intergenerational um, settler colonial trauma 
on trauma inflicted by settler colonialism that act as sources of division between family members. Being Kiowa and being Cherokee, however, also positions ever in different tribal frameworks and institutions of um, um, <clears throat> self-governance that are born out of the nation's respective different histories with the US settler state. Uh, in ways that both reference colonial histories of genocide, as well as structures of native support to offset some of the harmful effects of the ongoing history of settler colonialism. The indications of these frameworks are often quite material in nature, and so the novel sketches something such as the everyday infrastructures of native citizenship through the prism of Eva's life history moving within an intertribal multicultural reality. A central part of the novel is the chapter that is narrated by Eva's cousin Quinton on them both receiving the per capita payment by the, by the Kiowa. And he uh, narrates, here's the next uh, slide, so if the slides are here for you to read along. It was the collision of Kiowas, Comanches, and Apaches that leased a tract of land to Fort Sill military base for 100 years. Good thing too, because as Kiowas divided our share of the money between all tribal members, 1,500 apiece. Those of us under the age of 18 had our money held in trust going interest until our day. We were the last in our families, so the youngest, to hear our mother say, your per cap check is on the table. The per capita payment signals a nation to nation or political relationship of the Kiowa to the US connected via Fort Sill to a history of war, imprisonment, and dehumanization. As a chocolate historian Jackie Thompson Rand, who you also heard about in like the last few days in anecdotal ways, um, outlines in her Kiowa humanity and the invasion of the state, in which she shows how non-reservation Kiowa in the 1870s had been treated at Fort Sill as prisoners of war and were, I quote, deprived of liberties and life-sustaining necessities. Through the lease of the land to Fort, military, military, to Fort Sill military base, however, the Kiowa and their coalition also managed to create a form of transgenerational financial support for the community that, even if modest, becomes in the novel a source of joy, youthful defiance, and also a means of caring for kin. At first, for a long time in the chapter, it is narrated only as a moment of irresponsibility. They get to spend all the money, um, except for a car for both Quinton and Ever. So the two days where they receive the money are two months apart, but in the chapter, it's sort of like uh, narrated together, like you did this, I did that, and so on. So like we have the impression both days happening kind of simultaneously, or the way that uh, they are remembered. So they, they, they buy a car and then everything else is spent how <clears throat> much of everything else is spent on the per caps party where they provide everyone with drugs and alcohol. Um, so, which is a behavior that is focused on hedonism and intoxication in a way that appears to reflect the behavior of neglectful male figures in the novel, such as um, Eva's father. At the same time, however, the joy lies not just in spending the money, but being able to use the money carried from the lease to the state exactly as they want, and that they are able to take the money from a settler institution who has no choice but to accept those terms. That for the settler order, such money, <clears throat> um, you know, such an arrangement that allows native youth to come into possession of so much money or any money at all is suspicious, is demonstrated by Hokea's portrayal of the bank teller. It's the next quote. She glanced from the check to our face and back to the check again, tapping those red plastic fingernails on the counter. Her, by, her eyes barely squinted when she asked us how we managed to get our hands on that kind of money. You told her the tribe wanted to help elected bank tellers buy bleach for untreated roots. Ultimately, however, this structure of financial support for the Kiowa community becomes a moment to acknowledge the support of and, and care for kin. Both Quinton and Eva use the remaining money to help their mothers in various ways. Eva buying his mother furniture, 
for her newly uh, acquired uh, Indian home that is secured for the family by the Cherokee Nation. And uh, Quinton, among other things, buying a quote, a huge black and white photo of Chief uh, Satanta over in Darko, and it was in a gift shop at the Southern Plains Indian Museum. And then later at a, at a power with raffle tickets purchased from Ever's money, his mother is, is, is able to get a similar uh, photo. With the focus at the end of the chapter on, on Chief uh, Satanta, who fought US invasion, was sentenced to murder, then commuted to life imprisonment, and was interred in Fort Sill until his parole in 1873, both the violence of US settler colonialism, which the per capita payment is a result of and which it seeks to oppose in its own way at the same time, and the leadership of the Kiowa as a source for their resilience and continuity is put into strong relief. Thank you. Um, Chief Satanta had endured the genocide and still held Kiowas together. His strength flowed through all of us and continued to pull Kiowas close to family and community. God, those same black and white photos still hang in the middle of our mother's living room walls uh, too. And this is how the chapter um, concludes. And the novel incorporates Cherokee and Kiowa words uh, throughout that I will pronounce to the best of my ability. The desire for a home as a place for be of belonging and a place to support and raise one's family in runs strong throughout the novel and extends from Turtle, Eva's mother, to himself. In the novel, this desire is not abstract, but concretely manifest in having a house of uh, one's own, and most importantly, a house of which one cannot be dispossessed, because of the, the bank taking it, for instance. The housing program of the Cherokee Nation figures prominently in this regard. It provides, after a long way, turtle with a house, and in the final chapter becomes the chance forever to secure his own house in a way that provides a strong relief for a strained family and financial situation. Such support systems of the Cherokee Nation as the most prominent example in the novel to relieve some of the most dire pressures of life inflicted through ongoing colonialism and the difficult social issues it brings along shows both the everyday impact of citizenship as a formerly recognized and institutionalized belonging to a native a nation and also the limits and unfulfilled promise such a relationship can also entail. So the last chapter of the novel that is narrated by Ever himself begins with um, a quote, behind the counter at the Cherokee Nation Housing Authority stood a, a scorsty guy staring. The only words this evil Sopo managed to say were taking the first 50 application. It was enough chance, but my only chance, so I prayed. And then later he elaborates, I lived with my sister who'd inherited the house from our mother turtle who received the home through the housing authority years ago. Cherokee Nation would not be building any more new homes. The new principal chief made that clear. The only way you could get one now was through the distribution of repossessed houses. When I heard Cherokee Nation had 50 repossessed homes to give to Cherokee citizens, I couldn't miss the date. Saved it for months on my calendar. Here was a chance to get a forever home. The forever home that ever, through his status as a citizen, had the chance, has the chance to secure from the Cherokee Housing Authority also offers him his chance to keep his family together, as otherwise his oldest adopted son, Leander, might move back to Lawton to get away from the confined quarters of Ever's sister's home, and the other children might then follow him. The chance to raise his family together, united, belonging to Kiowa and Cherokee, but not torn apart between those separate places, is uniquely tied to the operations of Cherokee nationhood in the novel. In this, show, in this way, it shows how intimately the functioning of tribal government and one's own citizen status can affect one's life in ways that promise a way out of cycles of uh, family separation and dysfunction that have characterized Ever's past and are intimately tied to ongoing settler colonial structures. The novel, however, does not idealize this native citizen-nation relationship. Um, 
So in, in, in the conversation uh, with the others waiting overnight for the housing authority to open, so they stay all night waiting for, for uh, the office to open the next morning, one family waiting mentions the Copeland family as an example of the equality that comes from uh, nepotism and uh, corruption. This be the next, this like the, the longest, uh, that even like goes beyond the uh, length of the PowerPoint. Um, but bear with me. The Hochschulers brought up the Copeland family and how their relative was the director of the Cherokee Nation Housing Authority. Abana had funneled a home for every relative down to her nieces and nephews. She should go to prison, the Hochschulers sister said, and the brother followed with, all those homes should be repossessed for Cherokees who didn't cheat. It would mean 50 more homes for the um, community. All Cherokees had a fair chance to get a home, supposedly, on the day when repossessed homes were offered to community members. Everyone was to receive identical paperwork. Every family completed the paperwork at the same time on the same day and had equal chance to hand it in. But the Copeland family got everything early and it was all completed before they stepped through the door. The Copelands would stroll up to the counter, hand over the forms and secure their homes. Every other Cherokee scrambled to complete their directives and fill in each line before all the homes were taken. And so every adult in the Copeland family had ended up with a home each, while most Cherokee families were crammed into one. Now the recounting of the scene gets even more poignant at the end of the chapter, when exactly the scene of everyone scrambling to fill out the form and hand it in as one of the first 51 is narrated. And those who are tired after waiting all night are afraid of being overtaken by the ones who just arrived fresh in the morning. And the scene is depicted as one of people hunting desperately for limited uh, resources, something also talked about in earlier days, with celebrities forgotten and everyone only trying to secure their own goal. Ever himself has to push away people, push and dive through the crowd until his form is mapped with um, number 50 so he gets his home in the end and it's sort of like the like the, the happy end of the redemptive end uh, of the novel to be clear it's not meant to say that native or tribal nationhood institution it brings forth into the forms of support and and care another term that we've talked about um, in other ways offers to members through citizenship is in some way inherently compromised or faulty or flawed because it is portrayed in certain instances here as corrupt or nepotistic. If anything, it is one of the many instances in the novel in which the normality, the mundanity, even the banality of native social political life and how its institutional infrastructures pervade the life of its citizens is highlighted. In that a political community is shown whose institutions offer the possibility of care for its citizens in ways that assuage some of the most harmful effects of colonialism and also shows its imperfections as it runs against the limits of corruption and nepotism that pervade every political system. The other thing it runs up against are the limits formed by the settler state itself. More on that in a minute. And that is another thing I want to be clear about the form of native political belonging that I'm referencing here as citizenship in the terms of the novel is not one that is dependent on the Indian Citizenship Act um, the fact that native people are entering or being made to enter the US as citizens is in no way connected to native governance structures that work to take care of their own people. However, I believe the novel illustrates and can help us think about both the intricacies of a dual or in Eva's case, even triple citizenship. For instance, the novel shows how being a citizen to a native nation or community can work in such a distinction from being a citizen to the settler state, that the former is able to offer support and assistance that the, nata, that the latter neglects or actively denies to provide, or is actively maintaining and upholding damaging structures and practices that make support and assistance by the native nation necessary in the first place. And thirdly, what the novel also shows is that Cherokee nationhood and what a native nation can offer institutionally through citizenship does not on this level exist fully apart from or is untouched by the operation of the US settler state. Probably most clearly in this formal operation of a political formation, Cherokee uh, sovereignty functions as what Scott 
which that Lyons calls a sovereignty under colonialism, in that what it can do and the funds it has, it has access to are delimited by the so-called overriding sovereignty of the settler state. And not absolutely, but certainly to an important extent. In other words, there's a dependence in some form because the settler state has the power to hold on to and to reinforce the, the fiction of dependence. More than once, Novel points out how certain institutions, especially designed to help native citizens, cannot continue because of a cutback to funding, such as the Southern Plains Youth Development for Reoffenders. Wherever works and where he gets to know Leander, the Comanche youth, he ends up adopting. Shortly afterwards, at the powwow that features the blanket dance, which gives the novel its name, the MC calls out, this is the, another quote, uh, I'm calling for a blanket dance. This is for my nephew, Eva Jamo Saddle, and his kids. The company he worked for lost all of its funding, so he was laid off and his car was repossessed. In the way that U.S. settler sovereignty can affect the lives of the characters on an elemental day-to-day -day basis, so that seems to run parallel to Cherokee sovereignty only in an opposite direction. It, it, it diminishes resources of support rather than seeking to provide them. And finally, and by way of, of conclusion, the presence of the colonial border between the U.S. and Mexico um, also plays a role and marks the fraught nature of citizenship as a category for those who are deemed as foreign or exploitable by the state, and either state in this case. At the beginning of the novel, 1970s, uh, um, Everador, so Ever's father, gets beaten up shortly after Ever's birth, with him and Turtle being in the car by Mexican police officers as they attempt to cross the border to the U.S which shows a violent and corrupt border regime that is able to spot an easy target. Pertle sees in this moment America as a place of refuge. He thinks about running to the American side of the border. Here's the next slide. She just needed to make it to the US border. Surely the American officers would help her. She was American, her father served in the Korean War. But they are not able to escape their brutality of the Mexican border police until Turtle pays them off with her per capita payment. By contrast, the Mexican um, cousin on Eva's father's side finds herself unable, and this is now in the 2000s after 9-11, to quickly re-enter the US with her parents so they can visit the fatally ill baby um, daughter of Eva in the hospital to be there for the moment to say goodbye. Asserting that, and this is the final quote, I'm an American citizen. I was born here and so only a longer stay in detention and interrogation at the post-9-11 U.S.-Mexican border. Just as being a war veteran in the U.S. Um, Army only seems to make ever more suspicious to the border police earlier in the same chapter. So he endures similar treatment. In these instances, it becomes clear how fraught and unstable a category such as citizen is in the first place in a, in a racial state and um, settler state, something that, for instance, Claudia Rankin shows in her poetry volume, um, Citizen. So negotiations of citizenship, such as in calling for a blanket dance, means then also to think about the forms of citizenship and how easily these forms can, can be hollowed out and emptied out or, insta or instigated as those colonial impositions in the first place if they do not manifest in the everyday as forms of socially supportive structures and political belonging, including all its attendant complexities and ambivalences. Thank you.